We're ending out our theme for the year in being jaywalkers, walking like Jesus, and we're talking about the worthy calling that we have received. We found uh, in, uh, we've been looking at Colossians chapter 1, where Paul outlines some of the specific characteristics of a worthy walk. And in our study thus far, as we have gone to that text, we have learned four things about the worthy walk. Number one, it's a walk that seeks God's will, first and foremost. It's a walk also that seeks to please God in what it does. It is a walk that bears fruit, and it's also a walk that is continually seeking to become more intimate with God, to know God in new ways and in new fashions. So those are the characteristics we've looked at thus far. We continue in that same text today, and we're going to add two more characteristics of a worthy walk. And the fifth one is this. A worthy walk is one that endures troublesome times and difficult people. A worthy walk is one that endures difficult, troublesome times and difficult people. Here's our text. So that you may walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please Him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all power according to His glorious might for the attaining of all steadfastness and patience. The word that Paul uses here in the New American Standard is translated steadfastness, is a word that means to remain under. It has the idea of something constant, something being ever present. It's a way of identifying this characteristics of the worthy walk as being able to remain under negativism, to remain other, under a situation, a circumstance that would be undesirable and still being able to exhibit in the walk the person of Jesus. In other words, something that is far, than, far, far less than desirable is put upon us. We bear this. We are under this. But by the fashion in which we walk, we still walk as though we are free in Christ, not burdened in situations. That's quite a challenge for most of us. There is no situation that life can throw at the jaywalker that holds the ability that qualifies to be labeled a hindrance to a spiritually healthy hike. Life can't do that to us if we're walking in the footprints of Jesus, if we're walking a worthy walk. Now let's get more specific. There's nothing in school that life can throw at us that can hinder us walking in the steps of Jesus. There's not a trial, there's not a temptation in that environment that life can do that. There's not a situation in our jobs that can hinder us walking like Jesus, that can be the excuse for not walking. There's nothing in the church that holds the ability to keep us from being the people who walk in the footsteps of Jesus. We've been studying antagonism in the church, and that, that is a very painful experience. But there is nothing even in that painful experience that qualifies to take my feet off the prince of Jesus Christ. There is nothing within anyone's family that can be elevated to an excuse level and say, I do not need to follow the footsteps of Jesus any longer because I come from a very dysfunctional family. Anybody here not come from a dysfunctional family? <laughs> as painful as divorce is, There's nothing in that situation that forces me to not bear that situation and follow in the footsteps of Jesus. There is not a parental failure that I can throw my arms up as, as a complete failure as a parent and have an excuse for not walking like Jesus any longer. There is not a rebellious child that becomes an excuse. There is not an economic, a political, or a physical thing that life can put upon us 
that justifies us not walking in a worthy fashion in the footsteps of Jesus. There are no people who offer an excuse for a crippled spiritual walk, although we will encounter many difficult people. There's no one within the fellowship of the church. There's not a preacher, there's not an elder, a deacon, a teacher, there's not a member that becomes an excuse for my inability to walk in a worthy way. Don't exist. There are no unbelievers. There's not a boss, there's not an employee, there's not a rude clerk in the store, not those incompetent drivers that becomes an excuse for not walking in the path of Jesus. There is no villain, there is no malicious being, there is no revolting individual that I can say this now becomes the reason I can't walk like Jesus anymore because of this trouble. Now Paul says we walk worthy and one of the characteristics is We've got situations in this life that aren't perfect, and we've got troublesome people, but we walk in the footsteps of Jesus. Some of us want to wrestle with that, myself included. We want, we want to believe that there are some situations, you know, that just maybe make it a little harder to follow in the footsteps of Jesus. Maybe we can, you know, kind of deviate from the path a little bit just because of, of you know, this thing that's been dealt me. If what, I just, uh, if what I just said was my opinion, we'd have a right to argue with that, but it's not my opinion. What I've just shared with us is the will of God that was revealed to Paul and recorded for the Christians in Colossae. He said, a worthy walk is a steadfast walk, and a worthy walk is a patient walk. That's not my opinion. That's what the book says. And as we think about walking like Jesus and walking worthy, we've got to come to grips with how steadfast and patient our walk is. If I can just be brutally honest, I can tell you one reason why you and I struggle with the situations of difficult people. We want them to be an acceptable motive for a walk detour, a justifiable excuse for taking a slightly different path, a unique exception to God's revealed truth. You know why we want to do that? <laughs> it's because we're trusting in our own coping skills. It's because we're trusting our own fortitude, our own spiritual fortitude. We're looking at our own ability to concentrate and to bring things into control. We're looking at our own intensity. And maybe I just need to be, I need to be more spiritually focused. We're looking at our own vigor, our own might, our own ability, our own strength, and our own power. And that's the reason why we at some times believe that those things justify us not walking the way we're supposed to. Because we know we can't do it. We know that. There's not a person sitting here who knows that there is a situation in life that, they have to that they're going to struggle with. There's not a person here who doesn't know that I'm going to fail with difficult people. We know we don't have what it takes. So we assume we have an excuse for not walking in a worthy walk because we don't have what it takes. When in actuality, <laughs> the fact that we don't have what it takes should move us to accept the strength and the power of God so we can walk worthy. Let me ask you this question. What happens to the athlete's psyche when they believe they cannot win? What happens in their minds when they, don't, when they know they can't win, when they think they can't win, when they believe they can't win? You've been listening to all the interviews now, haven't you? You've heard the football team all talk about yeah, this is a possibility. We, we're, we can do this. We can do this. You know, did you have you ever heard one of them stand up and say, "You know, I think we're just going to get we're going to get wailed on. <laughs> we are going down." You don't hear that. Why? Because if they believe it up here, it'll become a reality out here. What happens to the athlete's ability when they believe they cannot win? Not only to their psyche, what happens to their ability? Oh, yeah. You've seen Rocky 534, right? The, the very first Rocky movie. Okay, you got this guy. He, he's got this desire, you know, to fight and ends up winning, winning the, uh, the championship belt. 
And, and if you were, you know, a Rocky fan, I suppose there are some somewhere, um, you know that that movie kind of represented Sylvester Stallone's acting career. You know, he, he wrote that movie, couldn't find anybody that wanted to produce it. Tried to sell it, couldn't find anybody who wanted to produce it. You know what he ended up doing, right? He produced it himself. And how many did, were there five? And then just recently, you know, when he's supposed to be too old to fight, he, he doesn't call it Rocky 700, and he, you know, he calls it, what, Balboa or something, and you know, he comes back and he does it again. Why? The mind. The mind and the ability link together. Now, let me go back to these questions. What happens to the jaywalker's psyche when they believe they cannot win? They don't win. What happens to the Christian's ability when they believe they cannot win? They don't win. I thought it, 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 I thought it, it doesn't take rocket scientists to figure this out. We already know we can't have a winning attitude over every situation that comes into our life. We already know there are difficult people that we don't possess the coping skills to deal with. We know that already. Anybody in here not know it? I want to make sure I'm preaching the truth. We know we can't do it. So what happens to us? What happens to our worthy walk? We don't do it. And hence, we want that to become some kind of legitimate justification, excuse for a weakened walk. In other words, God, you've you got to accept me because I just don't have the strength to do this. I can't be hammered like this and come out on top. I can't endure this, Father. All this situation is just too much for me. We're right. We're accurate. We're correct. It always has been too much for us. Hence, Paul says, the worthy walk. The worthy walk is to walk strengthened with all power according to what? His glorious might. I don't walk in my strength. I don't depend on my psyche or mine ability. The one who's to control my mind is the creator of the universe. And the one who's to control your mind during every difficult situation of, of life is the creator of the universe. The one who is to be the power over my ability is not me. It's the creator of the universe. So can I walk worthy amid every situation of life? Can I walk worthy when I have to be patient, patient, patient over difficult people? Can I still walk worthy? Absolutely when I'm strengthened with his glorious might, not mine. So the worthy walk comes down to whose strength am I trusting, whose power am I trusting? Here's the new living. I love the way it puts it. We also pray that you will be strengthened with all his glorious power so you will have all the endurance and patience you need. All that we need. The glorious power, from doxa, the root word of Greek, you, we sing sometimes the doxology, the glory to God song. It's understood usually to, uh, to mean glory, but uniquely the word is derived from two different words which give it the identity of to think, to seem, or to show. So the idea is that we are strengthened by how well we think on the power of God. Does that sound like some other passages you know? Think on these things. I can do all things through him who strength. Think. We think on the power of God. How well his power seems to be at work in our lives. How much we allow life situations to show his strength. That's how we walk in God's glory. It's not that the situation for the believer is better than the rest of the, of, the, of the unsaved world. We sometimes bear the same situation, but we walk with the glory of God in us. 
We show, we demonstrate something so different in those situations. And folks, we have a body here made up of so many different members, and we have some folks that are truly struggling with issues, situations of life, and they're walking like Jesus. That's how we need to walk. In the athletic world, many individuals are coached and trained in something that's called the self-sufficiency theory. Developed back in the early 70s, it's been tweaked and modified. And, and basically, it, it, it's a means of controlling the psyche and the ability of athletes. Here's a little quote uh, from a paper that was written by a couple of uh, college folks. Self-efficiency be beliefs are not judgments about one's skills objectively speaking. In other words, it's not just about, I can do it, but rather about one's judgments of what one can accomplish with those skills, what they think. In other words, self-efficiency judgments are about what one thinks one can do, not what one has. Now again, I want you to, to just process how many coaches around the country are utilizing this kind of technology, this kind of technique in trying to train their athletes. It's not about what you have. It's not about what you can do. Uh, it, it's about what you think. And again, they, they have different ways of using, the, but that theory pretty much is at the basis of motivating athletes all around the world. Now, again, we take and we try to apply that. You know, on January 1st, our Huskers are going to have success on the gridiron battle. It will, it will not depend upon what they have or what they can do. It will depend on what they think. And again, we've, we've watched, you know, we hear about, you know, the coach brings in some motivational speaker to talk to them, and basically it's always about, you know, think, you know, it goes back to the little book, I think I can, I think I can, I think I can, I think I can. That's, that's the message over and over. We, we try to develop that mental psyche. So too, our victorious and worthy walk within wearisome situations depends less upon our personal skill. Folks, I want you to get this. Our ability to walk worthy amid ugly situations of life is not about how much skill I have. It's about what I think my God can do. That's where that strength is. Self-sufficiency training for the jaywalker is not about what we can accomplish but about what we think we can accomplish through God's strength. Now, God and I make a pretty good team. I don't know about, about he and you, but what is there that life can do? Read Romans chapter 8. What is there that, that can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus? More specifically, what we think we can accomplish because our assessment of every situation is centered upon the strength, power, and the might that God is supplying to us. Okay. Now back to what can God and his strength do to my situation at school, on the job, or in the church? What can God do to that? What can God do in my family of dysfunction? What can God do with the pain of divorce? What can God do with parental failures? What can God do with rebellious children? What can God do economically, politically, physically? What is God able to do through preachers and elders and deacons and church members? What is God able to do through the arduous boss, the backstabbing fellow employee, the rude clerk, the incompetent driver, the villain, the malicious being, the revolting individual? What can God do? No wonder Paul says a worthy walk is a walk that is strengthened by the glorious power of God. Paul will write, he says, you know, I had this thorn in the flesh and I asked God three times to take it away. God didn't do it. Why? Because in weakness, the power of Christ becomes evident. You see, it's the situations of life which lead us to depend upon the strength of God and that becomes the evidence of who we're walking for. 
in Ephesians chapter 3, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith and that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. You see, it's those moments of weakness that bring us to being grounded in the ability of God. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God. You see, how many times do we read that, that passage about that armor and we think that's about something we do? I, I take up faith. I, I take up righteousness. Whose armor is it? It's God's armor. <laughs> you talk about David stepping into King Saul's armor and feeling uncomfortable. You and I have been given the privilege of taking on the full armor of God. We need to put it on. We have this momentary light affliction that has come upon us, and it's all passing away. We've been knocked down, but we haven't been knocked out. We are suffering, and in all of that, we are carrying the death of Jesus in us. We become the proof that we're following Jesus when we continue to walk even in those difficult times. So the difficult times are times when that the jaywalker learns it's about trust, not about ability and being self-reliant. We become savior sufficient rather than self-sufficient. The worthy walker does not despair during disparaging times. Rather, they deepen their dependence upon the dominance of the divine. Okay, and then lastly, Paul, what else needs to happen in me to walk worthy? He says, I need to walk in joyful thankfulness. Have you ever noticed <clears throat> this text here says that we should be joy joyously giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share the inheritance of the saints in light. Have you ever noticed we can pretty much complain about anything? You know, there's just kind of nothing we can't find. Some, you know, we can almost bring anything into the complaint department and find reason to complain. Uh, you know, we can complain about weather. You know, it's, it's always either too hot or too cold, too wet, too dry. We can always complain about weather. We can always complain about wages. We can always complain about government. We can always complain about traffic. We can always complain about service. You know, you go to the restaurant and you're the last person waited on. You wait 40 minutes for your food. Always complain about how well or not well we are served. We can complain about crowd. We can complain about anything. Throw any subject out there and somebody will be able to complain about it. We can complain about just about anything there is. A joyful thankfulness, however, is not contingent upon our outside circumstances. And Paul, in his text describing the worthy walk, says, Once I am living in the strength of the glorious power of God, my responsibility is to be joyfully thankful. While we do encounter some things in this life that are just good and produce joy, you know, if you gathered with family over this, this last week and had opportunity to be together, you, you can't help but just feel a joy about that. And that... You know, that situation brings on joy, but joy is not linked to situations. It's not tied to situations. Paul claims that the worthy walk is one of gratitude and that this unalterable joyfulness is rooted in our being qualified for a completely undeserved inheritance. God, through his Son and by his Spirit, has pulled me from the jaws of eternal hell. And because of that, I can be joyfully thankful in every situation, in every circumstance. The Lord has taken a dead end life and he has set it on the walk towards eternal blessing. There's not a person in this room who didn't live in a dead end existence serving yourself. Doesn't matter how wealthy you got, doesn't matter what great accomplishments you did, it was dead end. And Jesus takes us off of that course and he puts us on a path for eternity. And that's a walk, a jaywalk, 
that we're urged to walk worthy of. We must think often of where we would be if he had not drawn us to himself. Where would you be without him? And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. For whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Think often of where we would be. I'm not going to labor that point anymore because that basically is what next year's theme is all about. Learning to be joyously thankful for his grace reaches me. Movie Saving Private Ryan about a family whose, I can't remember the number of sons, have already been killed in World War II, one son still living. They decide there's a law or something that you can't have all your sons in, in war, and so they begin to search for Private Ryan to bring him back. In the search, most of the team that tries to rescue him ends up giving their lives away. The Captain Miller, as his dying breath, tells Ryan to earn it, to deserve it. The end of the movie ends with this scene of Mr. Ryan returning to Europe to that graveyard, standing before Captain Miller's grave. He looks to his wife and he says, tell me I lived a good life. He says, tell me that I was a good man. The great support that she was, she assures him that he was. We've been talking about jaywalking, walking like Jesus. It's easy for us introspectively to ask, Did I, do I earn this? Have I lived a good enough life for this? If we're not careful, we begin to develop a checklist of what we consider to be spiritual requirements to be deserving, to be worthy And so we assume we are worthy if we do and fulfill our list. If there's one thing we should have learned in the course of the year as we've thought about jaywalking, and that is there are none of us that ever walk worthy enough to earn the blood and the body of Jesus Christ. We will not live long enough. The worthy walk it's not if I've earned it. The worthy walk is if I long for it. Do I desire it? I can go to church every day. I can teach. I can preach without longing for the worthy walk. It has nothing to do with my spiritual heritage. I could have been going, coming to church since I was in somebody else's arms. I could be pushed into church by somebody else's arms. But it doesn't matter. As you think today about your walk being worthy, I don't want you to have the guilt of Private Ryan. I want you to have the burning desire of King David. Do you right now today want to be a person after the heart of God? That will change our life.
Worthy is not an achievement. It's on a desire to seek God's will, to please God, to bear fruit for God, to become intimate with him, to practice endurance in every of life's situations, to be patient. It is to live in joy and thankfulness. That's what Paul said our worthiness is all about. 